Um, so tēnā koutou katoa, um, e rere aku kupu mihi ki a koutou kua tai mai nei, ni nā, um, uh, ko Amanda Thomas tōku ingoa. Um, so welcome along everyone here and there. Um, um, my name is Amanda Thomas and I'm a lecturer in environmental studies uh, here at Victoria University um, and an early career researcher myself. Um, so today's webinar is about the importance of public scholarship, perils and possibilities. Um, we're scheduled to run from 12 to 1.30. Um, I, in my mind, we'll go to about quarter past one, but the idea is to have uh, some breathing room around that time frame if we need it. Um, so if I could just ask, uh, for the first half hour or so, it'll be mostly me asking questions of the panelists. So if I could please ask everyone to mute your microphones unless you're at uh, Otago or uh, Auckland, um, sitting at the same table as Sean and Tom. Thank you. Um, so as I say, the format roughly is going to be about half an hour of some set questions for these guys, our lovely panellists who I'll introduce in just a moment. Uh, we'll then open it up to questions and discussion because I know uh, a number of you have some um, kind of burning questions around the pressures, the opportunities of being a, a public scholar and at the same time an early career or postgraduate researcher. So to begin, I'll briefly introduce, very briefly introduce um, our panellists and would encourage them to say a little bit more about who they are um, and their identity as a public scholar as they answer the first round of questions. So to my left here, we have the lovely Ocean Mercia from Te Kawa Maui here at Victoria University. Um, Ocean did her PhD in physics um, and now lectures and engages in math uh, colleges. With how you to describe it, yeah. Um, we have Tom Baker at the University of Auckland, who is a lecturer in human uh, geography. And one of the reasons um, that we were so keen to have Tom as part of this panel is because he spoke at a Women and Gender Geographies Research Network uh, workshop earlier this year, and he kind of had some quite interesting perspectives about the kind of pressures of being a public scholar as well as the opportunities. Um, Next to Tom, we have Sean Hendy, um, as the director of the Pū Nahi Matatini um, at the University of Auckland, the Research Centre for Excellence, uh, who wrote the book in Science, which was published in 2015, is that right? Um, 2015. Um, and is currently on TV um, in, is it what, what Next? Is that the what, name? What Next? We can't quite get the hashtag right, but yes, What Next? <laughs> <laughs> as one of the expert futurists. Yeah. Um, so that's very exciting. And then down in Otago, we have uh, Lisa Timoringa, a nutritional scientist at the Department of Human Nutrition, um, an active uh, tweeter, and um, <laughs> someone who engages in participatory research design, which I think is a whole aspect of being a public scholar that uh, would be really great to explore in this time as well. So welcome to our lovely panellists. Thank you so much for your time and your knowledge. And I wanted to start uh, just by acknowledging just things that I have noticed in the news just in the past week. So there was a letter that was sent round um, in advance of the Royal Society to Aparangi Early Career Research Report. Um, they're running a competition this year encouraging early career academics to create short videos about their research that are to be made public. Um, there's also a new slot on Radio New Zealand on Thursday afternoons called Tell Me About Your Thesis. And at the same time, um, there's chat about how mainstream media is really um, struggling to cover science issues in sufficient depth. Um, and in the wake of the UK elections, people talking about how mainstream media gets things so wrong. Um, and indeed, we hear talk of academics who won't really engage with mainstream media at all because of the work been taken and um, misappropriated, misattributed, and instead choose to uh, access avenues like blogs or write pieces for the spin-off um, in order to kind of retain the autonomy of their voice. Um, and also, Rebecca Priestley here at the University is using some of her Prime Minister's Science Communication Prize money uh, to set up the Aotearoa New Zealand Science Journalism Fund. Um, so there's all these kind of um, tensions, opportunities and interesting and vibrant discussion going on about what uh, public scholarship 
looks like should be and the opportunities uh, that are there for us. So I wanted to go to the panellists and start by um, asking each of you what your assessment of public scholarship is in contemporary Aotearoa New Zealand society. So if we wouldn't mind going through that order, I just introduce you into Ocean, Tom, Sean and then Lisa. Okay, great. Well, thanks, Amanda. Kia ora rawatu and kia ora koukou katoa. Um, when I saw this question, I think um, my mind turned back to the invitation that was extended on this panel in the first place. And I thought of the people who I consider public scholars, um, and they were my head of school, Maria Baj, who appears as an occasional political commentator on Q&A. I thought of Marmari Stevens uh, in law, who appears, um, or who writes on social issues on her blog, Kareria, and she thinks the blog to her Facebook page. Um, I thought of my honor student, Ataria Sharman, who's uh, uh, brought the discussion on microaggressions from two years ago in her honours class into a piece that she wrote for um, uh, one of the recent salient magazines here on campus. campus. And I think of my PhD student, um, Elizabeth Kirikiri, who after decades of advocacy and activist work um, in the Whakatāpui LGBTQI communities, um, <coughs> her, her PhD to, in a sense, I guess, give um, academic legitimacy to that, uh, that part of her work and the way that she's um, uh, writing booklets that uh, are a different way to present her research. Um, and I, I did think of some men as well. I thought of, for instance, <laughs> Carwin Jones and his work on the Waitangi Tribunal, Mason Jury's Lifetime of Public Scholarship, uh, the, the work that Hedini Moko Mead has done that, on Tikanga Māori that underpins um, such a lot of the work that's, that's done now, sort of decades later. Um, so I, I guess there wasn't really a common denominator in the public scholarships in and amongst all of these people, except that they were a range of ages. Um, um, and and they, they included people whose, pub, whose efforts were not necessarily publicly known or famous but nonetheless um, underpin some really important public work in the shaping of policy, um, et cetera. Uh, so I think of, for instance, te reo translation work, um, and a lot of that work's very visible, the um, Māori names for, uh, I think of Sean's Institute, for instance, the Punaha Matatini, um, but the story behind that translation is, is not, not necessarily as visible. Nonetheless, that person, um, I guess, is well, I was trying to decide in my mind whether that person's a public scholar. So, <laughs> so the more I thought about it, the less sure I was about what public scholarship was, and I think that can be my contribution for now. <laughs> Thanks, Ocean. Tom? Um, if by way of international comparison, I suppose, it would seem to me that New Zealand has a very egalitarian approach to public scholarship and university staff are very engaged in very public forms of public scholarship, if you like, and Australia and Canada are the two countries that I'm most familiar with prior to coming to uh, Auckland to take up a position here. And those two contexts are much more hierarchical in the way that academics participate in public scholarship. I can't really imagine the barriers to entry there being as low as they are in New Zealand. And I do think from the time that I've been here, which is about a year and a half, that there really are low barriers to entry for public um, scholars that you can quite easily, by virtue of the fairly intimate media environment, at least in New Zealand, be engaged in media forms of uh, public scholarship. And the other thing is that university researchers appear to be much more prominent in New Zealand's public discourse than they are elsewhere and there seems to be a more open attitude to a variety of different forms of expertise and different types of knowledge in New Zealand than there are elsewhere particularly if I would compare it to Australia where you have the relative absence of indigenous knowledges as part of public discourse so I guess that's speaking to some of the things that Ocean was bringing up in her comments around the plurality of forms of public scholarship that New Zealand seems to showcase. 
So my impression since I've been here for a year and a half would be that there's a kind of world of opportunity for university researchers in New Zealand um, that is much more wide open than other countries that I've experienced. Mm. Interesting. Thank you. Sean? Uh, yeah, so uh, kia ora koutou. Um, I think you know, it's very interesting to reflect on those those comments, Tom. Um, I I was thinking in preparation for this question about, about how things are changing, um, and, I, and I think they are changing quite rapidly. Um, we, you know, we do have a, a, a long tradition of, of public scholarship in New Zealand. I think it, it you know, can go back, you can go back a very long way, um, and I think we've always had um, scholars have always been part of, of the discourse in New Zealand. Um, but I do think uh, that, that actually things are, things are cha changing rapidly and there's, there's, um, there's pros and cons to that. Um, I think, uh, uh, Amanda, when you opened, you, you talked about the, the role of blogs and social media and how that gives us new tools that, that lets us have more control perhaps over our voice, whereas previously that had to be um, filtered. Through uh, you know through the mainstream media or, or you know perhaps perhaps through through books and, and, and the newspaper um, and so that's that's a, that is a great opportunity and it, and it's an opportunity that that you know um, scholars at all stages of, of their career can access you know you, um, Ocean you mentioned your honours student um, starting down this path and I think I think you you know certainly I've got undergraduate students that are on social media and uh, using their um, their knowledge uh, uh, in the way that they uh, interact with social media. Um, so there's this there's this sort of this democratizing force, um, and and I and I think on on balance I, I feel that's that that is a good thing. On the on the other hand, um, was, uh, I am on TV at the moment. Although actually I, I I'm not um, directly in the firing line. I what I do is the Facebook Live part of the show, and it's been very interesting watching. Watching the people who are who are fronting the TV show and, and what's happening to them at the moment, and I think they're finding it very difficult, and that's because um, because of the existence of social media, <laughs> right? And so they're actually they're actually being picked out, singled out, tweeted at. Um, they're getting direct, almost real time comments on what they're wearing and what they're saying, and they're actually finding it pretty hard. Um, and, and I can actually see there's this clash going on that's making it even harder for them, right? There's the They've got advice coming from the TV professionals, which is keep it simple, right? You know, but last night they were told, imagine you're talking to a, an intelligent 12-year-old. Um, but actually, that's, that's what, what you're seeing then on social media is social media is reacting and they're not seeing the depth, <laughs> right, and what these people are saying. It's been very interesting just the last few days. I think now you can go on TV and you can say relatively sophisticated um, things draw on scholarship because people are sitting there with their devices. They can Google um, the documents you're referring to. They can discuss what you're saying and unpack it for others. So I, it, it feels like, um, you know, very much this class of cultures where, where the TV people are used to keeping it simple, dumbing it down, if I can use that phrase, and whereas social media has got appetite for complex ideas to be communicated and there's a, there's a, there's a tension at the moment. So I think we're at very interesting times where we're in a transition uh, between the, 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 the nature, the, the tools that we use, I guess, for public scholarship. Um, and I think things may, may be very different in a, in a few years' time. Mm. Yeah, I did see that piece on stuff this morning, an opinion piece that was ripping apart something someone was wearing, and I thought, oh, yeah, I, I, yeah, yeah. It kind of highlighted that tension to me of, um, yeah, this kind of space we're in at the moment. Yeah, no, they're sitting there, you know, they are watching it. They've got their phones below the table and they're watching people comment on what they're wearing or, or what they're saying in almost real time. That's so different. Yeah, we might come back to some of those um, ideas in a little bit as well about the kind of, um, yeah, the personal nature of a lot of this stuff and the ability to kind of, for feedback to be extremely personal and on a public platform. Um, so we might come back to that in a second. But over to you, Lisa. Kia ora koutou. Um, so coming from the nutrition field, I think that we probably have a long history of public scholarship because people have always been interested in food and because it's something everyone does and everyone can understand. So um, my mentor, I guess, Professor Jim Mann, has been a, 
you know, regular on the radio and TV over the years providing commentary on nutrition issues. Um, but in recent years, things have changed quite a lot with the advent of social media. And we, I think, in our field have been slow to catch on to the fact that a lot of commentary is happening in the social media sphere. And we have let vacuums emerge and be filled with people writing all sorts of quite um, sound looking blogs and stories about nutrition that are not necessarily fact based or based on sound science. Um, and now we're trying to compete with a lot of noise in that environment. And I think that if we don't engage and if we don't make a bigger um, effort actually in our field to get into those public spaces, then that's going to undermine our science field. Um, yes, yeah, so, I mean, there is a well-known academic, I guess, in New Zealand who has become very... I guess interested in nutrition science and has a very strong opinion that's quite contrary to the evidence base of nutrition. Um, but he's managed to use the media much more effectively than we have. Um, blogs, gets in the newspapers, gets on TV and gets himself out to all sorts of um, seminars and things, promoting a message that actually we feel as a nutrition body, probably 99% of nutritionists and nutritional scientists and dietitians would disagree with his analysis of the evidence. And yet, you know, he's been promoted recently to chief advisor of um, one of the ministries. And I think that's quite a dangerous um, mm thing to have happen so I guess that's where I might leave it at the moment just pointing out that we have to move into that public space just to, to prevent misuse or misreporting of information how the public gets to how they're able to um, differentiate between the evidence-based opinion of scientists and the layperson is a real challenge for us too. You know, we don't want to undermine and be seen to be dismissing because the public will hate us mm -hmm. for, <laughs> for being arrogant academics. But on the other hand, um, I can see that it's, you know, a lot of these messages that are being promoted, I think will undermine health in our field. And I can see the same in the, science, the climate change science. I think that's a really close area. Yeah, I think that's a fascinating point. Actually, Ange Barton has just finished her Master's in Criminology and I were chatting yesterday about that exact tension. Um, you know, people like Garth McVicker, who is over and over again given a platform, um, and yet there's lots of academics that are abolitionists. Um, there's the rise of these groups like No Part in Prisons and Just Speak. Um, yeah, about how they, how they counter... Uh, him when he is just invited to speak on every media forum that exists about anything to do with crime and justice and prison. So, um, yeah, I think that that, that that we have to, that, that's where the real political impetus is for us to be active public scholars. Um, I can see that really clearly in those examples. And in fact, it's quite difficult, I think, though, as scholars, because we, you know, we don't want to be black and white and use slogans because, you know, you're a scientist or a scholar you're mm. always hedging your bets a little bit <laughs> never quite convinced yeah. and um they they don't they don't worry about that trump doesn't worry about that you just state <laughs> the facts that you believe in and that's that and i you know I, i'd be reluctant to su suggest that we do that but you know maybe we need to think about how we frame our messages to be a little bit more on the same sort of ground that the those other people are presenting their information. So do any of you have any successful strategies for doing that, for um, how you talk to the media in a way, um, I guess, you know, you want to acknowledge the inherent uncertainty of science and knowledge and research, um, but that is not a good soundbite necessarily. <laughs> so, um, how, do any of the four of you have strategies for how you work around that? Um, so perhaps I'll, I'll talk a little bit about this. So, um, uh, I, it's it's funny. I, I'm not sure if you know. I often I'll give a I'll give an interview and, and say say you're talking to um, Radio New Zealand for Checkpoint. You know you 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 can have quite a long conversation with the journalist, 
um, and then there'll be 20 seconds or 30 seconds used. And often at the end, I can guess which, <laughs> right? It'll be where I said something colourful um, <laughs> or where I was more certain, right? The language I used was more certain. And that'll be what gets clipped out. So it's actually really difficult at times. And the sort of the way, at least I, you know, I acknowledge that, that that's going to happen and realise that I'm going to sound perhaps more certain or the colourful things are going to get picked out, is to then try and back myself up with more nuanced discussion via a blog or on social media. So acknowledging that the things that come out through the mainstream media are going to be filtered in a way that I can't control, but then, you know, can I then provide a more nuanced discussion elsewhere? Um, so that's kind of the way I I do it. I, you know, I, I find it's very, very hard to get something complicated picked up as a, as a in that sort of context, in that soundbite, and you just sort of have to acknowledge that you'll come across... Um, uh, more black and white than you perhaps intend when you're doing that kind of that quick, you know, reacting to a breaking story um, rather than a long form interview. So it's it's a yeah, it's sort of balancing it with other types of other types of media. Mm. I guess planning ahead as well. Like you might not have a lot of time, but before you speak to that interviewer or um, or the interviewer, I guess. To have your three main points very clear in your head um, and anticipate what you think it is they will find sexy <laughs> and <laughs> maybe embellish it a little bit so that that point gets um, across. That's the bit they pick, make, make it a little bit funny or controversial. Um, but sort of take control of the information in that way and don't go off message so that they end up reporting the blah that you didn't mean to say. Um, I know, I don't really have anything to add on this one, yeah. Tom? I only did to add that academics are often called on to provide the it's complicated message and that's almost their express role in, in these things. So sometimes to say it's complicated, that can be your one and only point. <laughs> Um, I noticed that as a genre of public scholarship in New Zealand and elsewhere, that it's the academic that comes on and says, well, wait a minute, there's more going on here. Um, so, and I think that's a legitimate moderating contribution to make to public debate a lot of the time. And you shouldn't necessarily feel like you've got to be dogmatic one way or the other. It can be, let's just wait up a second and consider that there are different ways to look at this or the information is uncertain or something like that. And I think being comfortable to have the, on the one hand, this, on the other hand, that perspective is something that is okay. Mm. Mm. Uh, the other thing I might add is just, actually, even if, you're, even if you don't, that doesn't get used, right, still explaining it to the journalist, right? Even mm. if you, the journalist is not going to put your science sound bite in saying it's complicated, at least yeah. if you can help them understand that the story is more complicated, mm. then that will help them in the way they frame mm. the story. Yeah, right. Can I just quickly ask as well whether the four of you have had media training? Any specific media training? Mm, I haven't had any specific media training, no, no. Um, Not me. I asked our marketing and communications people here at the University of Otago um, if they could give me some one-on-one -on -one training prior to going on to my first TV show and that was really useful actually and I'm I was quite happy with the way the story came out as a result. And she just pressed those messages about keep your message simple, know what you're going to say, have your core messages um, well constructed in your head so that you're not going um and ahhing on the TV screen. You know what you're going to say and you can articulate it really well beforehand. I, and try to be warm. <laughs> <laughs> I can. I mean, I haven't done it myself, but the, the Science Media Centre um, uh, Science Media Savvy courses uh, come highly recommended. Um, I mean, I think they, they run two-day courses that are fairly intensive, but they also do very short um, uh, versions of them as well, and they're often running them at conferences these days. They'll turn up um, and, and they'll run a, run a session um, for, for people who are a bit more time poor. But if you have an opportunity to go to one of the two-day sessions, I think those are really good. I've heard very positive things about them. 
And Tom, did had you have you had any media training? No, I probably should have. Now that you mention it, I'll take that off. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, add that to my to-do list too. Yeah. Um, so speaking of this science media centre and this framing kind of more around science, so three of you have backgrounds uh, that are more within, I guess, the harder sciences, you might say. Um, and I think there's this really interesting kind of emphasis on science communication and that discourse and narrative doesn't necessarily always include social scientists. So do you think there's a difference between between the way social sciences and, and non-social sciences approach the idea of communication, I guess the pressures that are experienced, but also like what could we as social scientists learn from the conversation that is happening more specifically within science? That was a long question, but any part of that that you want to answer? <laughs> <laughs> well, you mentioned Rebecca Priestley before, and um, she's... Um, and Rianne Salmon have been responsible for building up a program around science and society and I guess creating a bridge between um, uh, science, philosophy, history, um, science communication as well has been a key part of her, her work at Victoria University. And, um, and that seems to be a, a trend to me, a sort of a growing recognition of the, the need for um, science communication courses. Um, at an undergraduate level, um, and but as 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 far as the social sciences go, I um, I appreciated Lisa's comments before. Um, I think, yeah, um, there's there's definitely some gaps that we we don't necessarily feel like um, are we need to fill because you know as social scientists. Well, doesn't everybody understand our research? It's about people, right? Whereas the hard sciences, that's the hard stuff. That's where you need training in science communication. Um, and so I think perhaps we are sort of um, caught with our eyes half closed a little bit. Yeah. If I'm next in line, um, I'd say that one thing that social scientists can learn from the hard scientists, there are many, but one is that hard scientists tend to be very good at situating their often very specific research concerns within a wider field of social interest. Mm -hmm. And you would think, or one would think, that because social science is socialised already, that it has natural public import by virtue of it being about the social. So you'd think that someone that's a biochemist <laughs> would have a much tougher time prosecuting the case for why their knowledge is of use to the public but the reverse is often true that they're very good and perhaps they have been had this drilled into them as Ocean is saying that you need to connect your esoteric research interests to a, a, an area, a theme of social concern. So I think that's something that social sciences scientists could really uh, learn from the counterparts in hard science. One of the tensions though is that the hard science often relies on a form of authority that the social science uh, that social scientists find difficult to replicate or in some time some cases just incompatible with the form of scholarship that they practice the physical sciences the hard sciences are often reliant on a form of objective authority that comes from expertise that the public can't scrutinize that is only scrutinizable by uh, members of their um, discipline, where social scientific expertise, it can be scrutinized by members of the public and everyone thinks they're a sociologist or they've got an idea <laughs> about what politics is all about. And in that sense, no one from the public thinks they know astrophysics and can question uh, a so-called expert. So the way in which social scientists engage with the public often has to rely more on prosecuting an argument, being transparent with how you make that argument, preempting dissenting opinion but acknowledging it in a way that a lot of hard scientists, when they engage with the public, it's more about um, imparting truth to an, like an undereducated public or a public that, that doesn't have access to those facts. So I think there are some distinct differences or tensions, at least, in importing a hard science model of public scholarship into the social sciences that 
perhaps we can discuss at question time or something like that. I can expand on these things. Okay. Yeah, that was that was really interesting. Um, actually, I was going to copy some of those things. But so let's so yeah. I mean, let let me kind of put an emphasis on it. I mean, I'm a, I'm a physicist, and we kind of. Um, we're self-appointed at the, the hierarchy of, of the hard sciences, right? The mathematicians think they're up there. Um, so when it's convenient, I'll call myself a mathematician. Um, but yeah, there is this kind of, and, and there is, there is a sense that, um, that we do come in with, with, with this sense of authority. And, and so, um, and that perhaps allows us sometimes, and this is something I'm, I've done, is I go out and talk about other people's science, or I, or I talk about my opinions in other fields. Um, and, um, you know, and it's very interesting to, to do that and then, and then, you know, get feedback from the, the people in those other disciplines. <laughs> um, so, uh, you, you know, I think you've got to, particularly, you know, so physicists and, and the hard sciences are very well, are very well known for going around and colonizing other people's disciplines. That's kind of what we do. And, and to be honest, that's kind of the fun, I think, in some ways of being a physicist, um, is that you do, you can go work in lots of diverse domains. Um, but you do have to, you know, that, 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 that brings some challenges. Um, and, you know, in the way you approach your communication, you know, and even how you announce that you're a physicist, I get, you know, so I always try and, I always try, uh, you know, depending on what I'm doing, but if I've got an opportunity, I'll try and define my, my domain knowledge. Like, what do I, what am I really confident about? And then where am I being, where am I tentatively taking an idea from my discipline and, and throwing it into somewhere else? But you can do that in the wrong ways too. Um, and certainly I've caught myself using my authority as a physicist and pushing into domains almost unconsciously. So, so these days I try and be a little bit um, more cautious about that. And, um, and certainly I try and form partnerships with scientists in other areas um, uh, when I'm doing that. So that's kind of an interesting thing about that, or that your youth, use of authority as a, as a public scholar. Um, I think, and, it's, I, and to put on a martini, right, we've got economists um, who are kind of perhaps the, I don't know, they probably anoint themselves, put themselves the apex of the social sciences. Um, and so it's also interesting working with them um, around communication. And, you know, that one of, one of the things I've found um, is at least my the academic economists that I work with are really just not interested in talking outside their domain, um, <laughs> which I've found, you know, which, again, is not physicists will talk about, you know, will claim to be experts on anything. Economists, you know, that if they're not interested in it, they won't comment on it. They don't. It's been, it's been quite a little bit frustrating uh, mm. way that, I'll, you know, the media will come to me because we, we're, we've got a piece of research that they think is relevant and I won't be able to get my, any of my economist colleagues to, to talk on it because they, they, it's not interesting to them. It's kind of a, and, um, and then I do worry that, I mean, as, as, um, as Lisa was talking about, you know, there's this vacuum, right? Then, then if, if you don't comment as, as person, the person who's maybe the, the closest expert, then you, you know, there is going to be a vacuum and it'll be taken up by people who, um, who want to use that vacuum for their own purposes. So, yeah, I mean, I, th I think use of authority and how, how you choose to use that and how you approach it, and even if you're conscious of it, the way that you project it. And, I, I mean, I really like um, uh, Rebecca and uh, Rebecca Priestley and Rianne Salmon approach that they're taking at the moment, which is to talking about this idea of a reflexive scientist, a scientist that, that when communicating thinks as much about why they're communicating um, and how their, um, how their knowledge is being used and taken up um, and also listening. Um, I, you know, very, very partial to that approach um, to thinking about uh, roles as public scholar. Lisa. Um. What's the question again? I've... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, the question was a long one, but the yeah. essence was what can social scientists learn from people working within the hard scientists and the conversations about science communication? All right. So I think nutrition in the public sphere is often more of a social, you know, we tend to the social side, less so than the, the sciencey side because everyone eats food and has an opinion on it. Um, I think 
think though what we have, if we have any advantage of the social sciences, is that we have an example through which we can talk about social issues in a context that people can understand. So we can talk about the impacts of poverty on food choices and um, have some of those discussions around racism and social issues, I guess, that, um, that are easily understood to the public because we're, we're framing it around something that leads to what choices people make. So, you know, maybe the social sciences should be borrowing from our science examples to help, you know, articulate their knowledge and information. I just wanted to come to what um, Sean was talking about here about this, the hard sciences, I guess, having this authority. People don't understand probably, I mean, they don't necessarily understand nutrition that well either, but we, we can all understand it to some extent because we eat food. But, you know, science is the, the hard sciences. People don't know enough about it to really um, disagree with you. Um, and sometimes I get a little bit annoyed when I see people from the hard sciences coming in and making comment on nutritional sciences um, without fully understanding our field as well. And they have this authority because they're a biochemist or, you know, some sort of amazing hard scientist and their views will be given almost more credibility than the nutrition scientists, but may, they often don't understand the arguments, correct, uh, you know, into the same level of depth. So, you know, they can end up supporting people, the arguments, the fringe are making because they don't understand the nuances of our science enough. Mm, mm, interesting, kind of, yeah, disciplinary complementary yeah. intentions at the same time and kind of tricky stuff around navigating that. Yeah. Um, my next question, which I'll flip the order for, so straight back to you, Lisa. Um, what are the greatest rewards, do you think, of being a public scholar and the greatest constraints to being one? Well, I think, you know, as a relatively early career researcher, that it's a way for us to make our own path and um, create our reputations in our field um, that will be separate and new from our mentors and, you know, the, the old guard, I guess, who have done things in a different way. And um, there's a lot more competition out there, hundreds and hundreds of journals. So doing things in the traditional way, I think we would just be invisible. So social media has the power to get our science out more publicly where it can have more impact. And also it gives us personal opportunities to speak to a broader audience. I mean, as a result, I think of being involved in social media, I've had a lot of invitations to speak at conferences and public meetings and things like that, that I don't think I would have quite had if I hadn't sent out that really quite um, my tweet, my tweet that led to my internet fame, <laughs> my social media fame. Um, but, uh, yeah, I I think those are the opportunities. The 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 what was it? The um, consequences, the harmful effects, might be that you leave yourself a lot more open to criticism from a much broader audience. Having said that, you know, I think old time scientists were probably pretty harsh to each other in the small enclosed venue of a conference, and it possibly is a bit more cutting when you're cut down by a big professor than when you're cut down by a lay person who you can say, well, they don't really know the issues. Um, and I think when you're navigating that space, you just have to let it go. And I've got much better at just not, you know, someone calls me an idiot, tells me I haven't been working hard and I'm lazy, you know, oh well, let it go. Maybe respond once or twice, but don't engage into these deeper things and just, just keep doing what you're doing. Just, you know, believe in what you do. Feel like you're making a difference. That some people are going to hear the messages that you put out there and some people are never going to hear them. And don't worry about those people so much. Focus on the ones that you know that you are going to have an influence over. Mm. Cool. Thank you. Sean. Um, yeah, I mean, I think I think agree with everything Lisa said there. I mean, um, you know, certainly it's a way of, of achieving more impact with what you're doing. I mean, I think the things that have drawn me into it, uh, uh, partly, partly um, 
you know, wanting to be relevant. I mean, I, I started out in a very esoteric area of physics, and if you kind of look, you know, with my PhD was on gravitational waves, which are now hot, and now, you know, um, there's lots of stories about gravitational waves that I'm now slightly jealous that I didn't stick around to enjoy, but, <laughs> but you know, I sort of gradually, I've, I've wanted my work to become more and more relevant. Um, it was interesting, I think, Tom, you, you well, someone, someone talked about how, how hard scientists were good at making their, their work relevant. I think there's a strong desire to, to, to do it. We're very, I think perhaps when you're grounded in a, in a real, you know, increasing social issue, um, you don't have to reach as far. But, but I think natural scientists, we're always having to question why are we spending public money on this relatively esoteric um, uh, uh, area of work that, that you know, only a few people really care about. So I think we do work hard, and, and at least for me personally, that, that's a lot of why I've got into, um, into um, talking to the public is, to, is that, to give myself that personal satisfaction that I am actually making a difference. Um, so that's that's a that's a big benefit, right? It just actually makes you feel good <laughs> um, that, that that you're you're doing this work and you're and you're um, you're adding to the um, uh, to public debate. Um, I think that, I mean it, it definitely makes. I mean, so I again one of the benefits to me has been the, this ability to work with different disciplines because I'm you know I I. Um, you know, 10 years ago, I just would have gone to physics conferences and I'd be talking to physicists. But because I'm, I'm talking in the media, I'm writing um, uh, popular books and so forth, I get to make all sorts of connections um, that I never would have before. And, and actually, that, that's almost defining my research these days, are these, uh, these um, uh, interdisciplinary connections. And I, I personally find that really, really stimulating. Uh, in terms of the constraints, I mean, I think, um, uh, you know, it does take effort, right? I think to, to, to do it well, I, I you know, I, I used to, when I was part of the McDiamond Institute, I used to get, I used to see Paul Keller um, uh, doing his thing. And I mean, there was, and there's no question in my mind, Paul was an absolute natural, right? He had, he, it was, it looked effortless. But, but what most people don't know is he worked on it. <laughs> He would work and work and work. He'd listen. I, I can't listen to myself on the radio. I, will, <laughs> I, I just cannot do it. Um, and, and, but he would, he would play back clips, right? Um, and he'd, he'd, he'd practice his lines so he'd get his sound bites out. So I think it shows that even people that look like it's, they'd, you know, they've just come into it and it's effortless are working really hard at it. So it does take a time commitment, I think, to do it well. Um, yeah, and, and so that, and that, you know, you, you're putting effort into that and you, you're giving up time that could be spent elsewhere and across, you know, acad academia will expand to fill any available space and so you have to, you do have to um, carve that space out um, and your colleagues may be resentful of that. And I guess that's what I'll, that's what I'll perhaps finish on um, is, is the, um, that, yeah, you, you, you know, you can get sideways looks from your colleagues um, there's, you know, I, 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 in Silencing Science, I wrote a little bit about this. Like, who's, who, do, who, do, who has the right, you know, who, who does academia give the entitlement to, to do this work? And I think traditionally it has been senior academics, right? So it was something you did in your dotage. Um, uh, and, and so I certainly think that's part of the dynamic sometimes that uh, senior academics see younger academics coming through and grabbing the limelight, and they've kind of been sitting in their office waiting, waiting for someone to come and take <laughs> their work. And suddenly, this young upstart has got all the media attention. And I think that does, that does produce a certain dynamic um, that 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 you know may, may work against you. Mm. Yeah, I think that's met so many things in there. But I think also just going back to your point about how, for me, as an early career academic managing so many balls in the air and it feels like another ball that is an important one but how you fit that in and yeah it's kind of where I'm at and stuck at at the moment so Tom tell me how I fix that <laughs> <laughs> well, I might start from the trivial and move to the substantive I think on its most trivial um, if you're a PhD student or a postdoc or someone at the very early stages of their academic career 
a form of public writing might be the only way your parents understand what you've been doing. <laughs> and I think my mother and father had no idea what I was researching when I turned up to the office. And I don't think they had any conception about what I did when I turned up to a workplace for the PhD until I wrote an opinion article for a paper. And they're like, okay, now I, now I get it. You've actually been doing something of use to the world. <laughs> so, that could be a reason enough to do a bit of public scholarship is to prove to your parents that um, you've done something worthwhile and, you know, the reason you gave up that job in the public service was for a decent enough reason after all, or whatever. I'm, I'm divulging too much about myself here. <laughs> the other sort of trivial reason is that it's inherently gratifying, I think, to try to translate what you have written for an academic audience or debates that you participate in and translate them for different audiences. Because if you're into, I don't know, post-structural social science and you're into a bit of Michel Foucault, trying to extrapolate Foucault or sort of the nub of the insight that that theory gives you, never referring to it, obviously, in a bit of public writing, but just extracting that piece of information that's critical, I think there's something intellectually stimulating about that process in and of itself. And I've written the odd opinion piece for a newspaper or two, and it's it, it, there's arguably as much satisfaction in writing a 600-word op-ed as there is of slogging into a journal article you've been working on for months and you're going through the second round of revisions for. So I think it can provide some... Um, it can keep your working life interesting, working on these shorter projects that are put out there, they're quickly consumed, and then you get back to the grindstone activity of writing a journal article. Sort of moving toward the more substantive, I suppose, is that you have the opportunity to lend, for want of a better term, your scholarly capital to issues, to organisations, and other things that you care about as a human being. So by writing about the work of an organisation that does good things for the public or good things for the community in which they're embedded, that is a service in and of itself. Um, and bringing to, to light the work that a particular person does, an organisation does, or an issue that has gone underrepresented in public debate is a good reason to be engaged in public scholarship. Um, and then another one at its broadest level would be to participate in embedding the university in the community itself. Um, no one's used the word ivory tower yet, which I'm, I would have put money on coming up. Um, but these forms of public scholarship do really do um, embed the university in a way that I think is inherently a good thing to do. And in New Zealand, it seems that universities are very much a part of um, the community, part of the public in a way that my engagements in some other places have led me to think that they are much more ivory tower-like institutions. So those would be the, the rewards. The constraints probably pick up on what other people have said, as in there are very minimal professional incentives for an early career researcher to engage in public scholarship, despite it being looked upon positively by your department or by potential employers. I think if the choice was produce an article or engage thoroughly in public scholarship. You may as well produce the article. That's what will get you a job, I think, still. I might be mistaken, but I'm pretty sure hiring committees would much rather you have produced that paper than written the three opinion articles that took you three weeks and took your mind out of your other job. Um, that said, I think hiring committees these days appreciate that you have at least shown some capacity for public engagement, to be able to move beyond the, the standard outputs of academia. So I think if you can do some form of public scholarship, show that you're capable of it, that is helpful in securing some form of employment. But I don't think a substantive engagement in public scholarship that would detract from your ability to do the other things that in universities, to put it bluntly, care more about and will get you hired and promoted. Um, I think some form not headfirst into public scholarship would be advisable. 
Um, and then the other one that Sean brought up right at the start of the conversation is the disincentives from a personal and professional level to put your head above the parapet, so to speak. And those things fall disproportionately um, according to gender and racial divides. So the, I'm a Anglo-Saxon white guy, um, heterosexual, everything's going to go pretty well for me, I think, if I put my head above the parapet, or at least I've got enough hubris to not care about it. But if you're a, a woman or an Indigenous person or a whole number of intersectional identities, then it does uh, come down on those people much harder than it does for people in majoritarian groups. And I'm sure the people on the TV show, it's probably the women they get commented on about what they're dressing like, for example. Yeah, it's, it's not in this case. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. Well, good to know that yeah. the tide's turning <laughs> coming back around yeah. and the straight white guys. Yeah. But those would be the sort of disincentives that I'd see to be involved in forms of public scholarship. Yeah. I'm going to rip off of Tom's last call there in a moment, uh, but just so that, um, you know, I'm not just doing the cliched response from, you know, female um, Maori perspective. Um, I just want to say I totally agree with all of the comments there on academic identity, um, the relevance of our work and um, in, in the ability to talk to different people that's fostered by um, engaging in public scholarship. Uh, but what I want to go back to is something around expectations. And I think for, for me personally, um, as soon as I um, sort of finished my degree, I became first in family to, to, to do that on my mum's side. Um, and so there's a certain expectation at that point. At that stage, you know, fairly isolated to the whanau, um, that I would continue on and, and ultimately do something that's useful for uh, for the wider community. Um, so I, I didn't really feel that expectation very heavily at any stage, but um, but the other thing that went along with that, of course, is the, the sort of continued profiling of, of the Maori woman who's doing a PhD in physics or has been completed a PhD in physics. Um, and so there was, there was sort of this ever-expanding circle of expectation I, I felt flowing out from, um, from being in, in that position um, and having uh, that impact. And just going back to something I think Sean was saying um, about physics. I mean, my thesis was on colossal, colossal magneto resistance. And um, unlike gravitational waves, I don't think they ever got hot. So, <laughs> so I came out at the right time and I crossed over to Maori studies. But I always just felt um, it was it was just very very difficult to publicise that research in a way that the sort of inner communities in my life um, could grasp and understand. And I guess partly that was perhaps because I wasn't that convinced that they were the next big thing either. But um, <laughs> But there was always a particular tension, um, and that's, I guess, part of the reason for my movement across to Māori studies from physics. Um, yeah, so, so Sean, your comments before um, about colonising other disciplines, uh, was, you were totally describing me. <laughs> um, yeah, so, so something around expectation, I think, has driven... Um, a lot of my engagement with these things, because actually I'm not really a limelight person. I'm not uh, someone who seeks the television screen or the, the media outlets. And uh, I'd much rather um, hide away in the ivory tower and write a bunch of papers, to be honest with you. <laughs> but these expectations uh, mitigate against that sort of natural tendency of mine. And, um, and now that I am in a position where I feel like um, my, my message... Um, uh, which is a message really that Māori were always scientists um, and all that sort of flows on from that statement. Um, it's, it's really interesting to see how people sort of pick up that sentiment and it uh, erodes, starts to erode barriers in their minds around Mātauranga Māori and its, um, its value and legitimacy in different spaces. So, um, so that's, that's a real reward, I think, is um, the how those conversations sort of bubble up in different places. Um, 
yeah, and getting to be a part of that's a great privilege. And I think my family better understand what I do now than what I was working on colossal magneto resistance. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, awesome. Thank you, guys, um, very much. And I have more questions, but I'm also conscious that I've eaten way into the question time um, already. Um, so we'll open it up now for questions from you all. You should have on your screen somewhere a wee hands up button. So if you click that hands up button, I can click you, you unmute and ask the question. And if you've got it to someone specifically on the panel, if you could... Um, say specifically who, or if it's just for everyone, and if you could also introduce yourself, that would be really helpful as well. So, any questions? Yeah. Um, hi, um, so I am currently sort of doing my master's thesis on um, public intellectuals or kind of people who might be considered counter subjectivity but maybe don't necessarily um, fall in traditional scholarship so I'm thinking just community based people um, but something that I'm really particularly interested in is how um, people are able to emotionally sustain the work that they do so kind of the subjective element of constant being in public and um, yeah, I just wondered if anyone had any thoughts regarding how they perhaps, I don't know, kind of maintain the capacity to continue to be in public over and over again, given what we've touched on regarding like social media difficulties and just judgment in general. Can you just give me my phone name? Oh, hi, I'm Sasha Francis. <laughs> Sasha Francis. Perhaps, so I, I attempt to answer that from my perspective. Um, I mean, like I, I there was a barrier that I had to overcome initially to start doing this. Um, I remember the first first time I got a call from a journalist, um, uh, you know, asking me to talk about something. Um, I I just said no, no, no. I'm sorry, I'm busy, <laughs> <laughs> and basically hung up. Um, and then I had a long, hard think about it. You know, I remember walking home that day thinking, well, that, w that really wasn't the right thing to do. And, um, and so the next time it happened, I reluctantly said yes and did it. Um, and then, you know, I, I sort of said, well, look, I, that wasn't so bad. Um, I'll keep doing this while I enjoy it, while I can still say that, that I'm having a positive experience. And then I'd, I think it's, it's doing more of it has become more rewarding and I've found it more positive. And so, it, so these days it really is sustained by the fact that I enjoy it. Um, and, and uh, you know, there are some downsides. Now, that's quite a privileged position. I think Tom was quite right. The, the idea that, um, you know, as a, as a, as a white middle class um, uh, man, right, it, 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 no one has any expectations that I should be doing otherwise, right? I mean, it's, it's accepted in some sense that I, that, that I will have a public voice if I want one. Um, so I don't get the, the negative kickback. I remember um, one morning um, getting an email from my dean telling me I'd been whale-oiled. <laughs> um, and uh, and I, I was, it took me a while to work out he meant that I'd... Um, that the, that well, at the big time. Yeah, the big time. Yeah. And so I, you know, so I went over and had a look, and he, he, I mean, he basically complimented me, right? It was really, he was, he was trying to put me down, but he couldn't help but describe me in positive terms, right? Which I was just astounded by. That if you can't, if whale oil can't even bring himself to, um, uh, to have a go at you, um, when you, I, I, it's just astounding. So I think, I think you know, that to me just reinforced the, the privilege I have, I guess. Um, so, so I do it because I enjoy it, and and I have to be honest that it's it's quite. I think I am in a privileged position. I do it because I enjoy pushing buttons, and you know, I <laughs> bring it on if they want to <laughs> knock me down for being a woman and being Māori, because actually I feel that by being outspoken, I'm setting a, an example for other Māori women and Māori communities to feel confident in having a say, contributing to dialogue. 
And the other thing that keeps me going is that it's about the message I'm trying to sell, not about me. So I don't dwell on the things I, I try not to dwell on the things I said that were dicky or wrong. Or, you know, it's, it's just think about the next time and what you're trying to achieve. And for me, I'm trying to achieve better health literacy and better outcomes for Māori in particular. And, and, um, and I think it makes it enjoyable. Hmm. For me, uh, it probably stems... Oops, you go. Okay, thanks, Tom. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I found uh, bringing these scenarios, turning them to, into a teaching exercise, so that bringing them into the classroom and um, anonymising my data, of course, but, um, but presenting it to students helps me to deal with any emotional fallout that I'm feeling from, you know, negative comments that might come up in, in media. Um, circles and so then it becomes oh it's a teaching exercise and we're learning about context and um, yeah so that helps to depersonalize a lot of that stuff for me but um, but yeah like the comments that came through on the uh, for these these people on um, on what next um, what what people seem to get most from Project Matauranga my TV show is that I'm wearing lipstick or I'm wearing a white coat and I never wear that. So it's like, come on, there's issues with your people. This is what <laughs> oh, get past that. So I mean, that's more sort of fun than anything, but it, it does grate a little bit, the constant attention on, you know, particularly for the uh, on, on the body. Mm -hmm. uh, for me, part of how I want to conduct my research these days or increasingly is to have part of the research that um, participates in academic discussion purely on its own terms and for its own reasons, but to build in topics of interest that I might be able to hive off into the public domain. And I haven't been all that good at doing this, but it's the intention behind it that I'm trying to build into these things. So part of the motivation for participating in these sorts of forms of public scholarship is simply to make research of relevance to audiences beyond peers, research peers. But the forms in which I've participated in public scholarship are not particularly heavy going as far as public scrutiny goes. So I've kind of been very conservative in exposing myself to some of the vitriol of um, other commentators and members of the public. So writing for publications like The Conversation, which for the early career people out there, I'd recommend as a way to dip your toe in the water of public scholarship. It's, a, it's an online platform that's meant for academics to translate their perspectives for public consumption. And there's very um, civilised forms of interaction that happen on the conversation compared to other forums. So that's a quite a a low risk strategy, I think, that I've been part of. And then writing things for newspapers is fairly um, tame compared to television, I would have thought. Um, but also forms of public scholarship that remain hidden from view might be another reason to get involved in these sort of things. For example, I've written speeches for politicians that didn't have my name on them, that had the politician's name on them, but allowed me to sort of insert some ideas. Um, <laughs> so that's another form of public scholarship that's quite gratifying when you see that what you've written has been spouted out of the mouth of a politician um, and they are people that actually have some cachet and that can get things done. Um, so that's rather satisfying. It is another thing that I think people could get involved in if they'd like. Mm. Awesome. <coughs> Other questions? Can I, can I, ask, can I flip, flip the question a little bit? My question was about, and I think maybe Lisa could answer this, because you're talking about how um, <clears throat> people who really don't have the authority to have an opinion on a certain topic step into the void if perhaps the mm. expert hasn't um, occupied that space. How would you as an academic counter that? Is there a danger in actually engaging in discussion with that individual who stepped into that space or does that kind of give them an authority because you, you the academic or the authority are now engaging with that person or do you ignore them? Is there a strategy that you should... I try and ignore them. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> and make sure that we're putting our own stories out in the public space as well. Or sometimes we might subtly 
acknowledge them that only if you knew the field you might see the links there but and sometimes you might want to engage with them I, I think we've got to mix it up maybe Sorry, would you mind just saying your name, the person that asked the question? Gillian. Uh, Gillian. My name's Gillian Elliot. Um, I just recently completed a PhD, but I'm, I'm also a librarian uh, uh, in a research environment, so I'm very interested in um, yeah, open research and making research more open from a professional, but also from that personal PhD journey. Um, so a bit of both there. Thank you. And did someone at Auckland have something to add to that? I, yeah, I mean, I think that... that um, it's really uh, your question is very, very much uh, um, still, still debated, right? I think I can think particularly around um, climate change. Uh, you know, from time to time, there'll be there'll be someone who's brought out um, to New Zealand to, uh, to try and undermine climate science. And there's, there's, you know, and I've been a participant in some of these debates. Is should we engage with this person or not? I think it's a really difficult call. Mm. Um, uh, as to as to what to do, um, and and so you know I think I think per, perhaps pick pick your strategy sometimes. I mean sometimes it can be sometimes it can it can work to engage with someone who's got controversial views, and it, and it can look bad if you don't. Other times, particularly people who are very very good at it, right? I mean, um, but you know someone who's been paid to be brought out to to sell a message that climate change isn't real and it's all a big hoax, um, those people are probably very, very good um, at public debate um, and probably much, much better than you are. And, um, you know, I've been in a situation, I guess, where, where I um, it was, it was early on in my career and I was on a panel um, and they, you know, I, I, I was the opening person on the panel because I was the scientist and I was asked, you know, give it, I would talk, I was, my brief was to sort of give us the fact kind of thing and, but, you know, speak for three minutes. And so I, I spoke for three minutes and then no one else on this panel spoke for three minutes. They all, they all took 10 to 15 minutes. And so I got to say almost nothing. Um, and then I'd been on this, pa on this panel with people who were really, um, I, you know, I had no opportunity to respond to. And they were obviously very, you know, they'd gone in there with that strategy that they would just basically talk this panel to death. Um, and, and I think it, was a, it worked. <laughs> Actually, I, so. I did the opposite one. I mean, it's only really one panel. Um, the, there was going to be someone on that panel with me um, who had very controversial views in our field and I that's when I went and got some media training beforehand and right. I decided that I just wasn't going to let him give air to his views that I disagreed with and I just interrupted him every time he got onto those topics and decided <laughs> I was taking control. <laughs> it worked. Excellent. <laughs> but I, I don't know if that is very sound. <laughs> one of one of the risks of not engaging with um, such people, I suppose, is being played out in the United States, where a whole segment of society feels as if people that speak for their views have been systematically excluded from um, proper debate. Um, and their views are obviously ill-informed or bigoted or a whole range of things, but they themselves feel as if um, sort of the liberal media or whatever the, the whipping boy is has excluded them from participation in debate. So I think that obviously it has to be done on a somewhat case-by-case -case basis, but the risk of just turning your nose up or saying these people are idiots or whatever is that the people um, that sympathise with those points of view feel justified in thinking um, that what their view is is being systematic, systematically excluded from public debate. So it's a kind of the Donald Trump situation is a real um, spanner in the works for people of the Enlightenment that would like to debate these lunatics but, um, or would like to exclude them, but feel compelled to debate them on their own terms. So I don't quite, as you're saying, Sean, it's, there's no simple answer to it. It's never wise to call them, you know, like, to call them out as idiots. I think you have to, when they've got Trump controversial views, you want to control, try and control what they're saying to some extent. Let them say the things that you can agree with and, um, 
look fear and balance you know as soon as you start to get it to be a bit personal to try and make them look bad then I think you end up turning their supporters against you so mm. I think trying to stay f as though looking as though you're fair-minded is really important even if you're not <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I would agree with that it's just sort of run your course um, and for some reason Paul Callahan and you mentioned him before Sean has has come to mind I mean he's just sort of the ultimate role model when it comes to science communication solid science but also speaking into all sorts of I mean the ripples of Paul Callahan continue in all sorts of areas of our of our lives from Peter for Free 2015 to you know to just about everything else and so he's he's very much a role model for me he's someone I've worked with for a while and um I, I, um, I'm not saying that I'll ever be Paul Callahan, but I think if, if we have these sort of um, models and exemplars, they can kind of give us give us a bit of a, a steer when um, you know things look a bit rocky either side. Mm. 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 So I'll just add a bit of practical advice. I mean, again, the science media centre people will often you know can often give you advice on dealing with controversial issues and so um, so if you get in touch with them you know they, they can give you advice like should you debate this person or not or, you know how, how is it going to look how is it going to play in the media if you do this so from a practical point of view if you do find yourself in that situation going to them for advice um, is probably a good idea Any other burning questions from anyone? We have a question here. I don't think you can see Bill on your screen. Do you want to move over here? Hi. Hi, my name is Hi, um, Just wanted to, I'm doing, my name is Bill Hurry. I'm finishing off my PhD on um, public geography, um, uh, which is more specific you know, than, than science. But I want to ask, how do the people differentiate between your public scholarship and, say, public promotion of your discipline? And I'm thinking of something like, you know, Susie Wells, who's on the radio promoting science, or Michelle Dickinson, and which is more promotion than almost public scholarship, I would argue. And, and how do you take that engagement, if it occurs, and then add your scholarship to it? Question? Mm. Um, yeah, I think I think they're two important parts of the same coin, really. Um, as you as you point out, um, the challenge is the link from one to the other. Once you've got people's ears, how do you then go on and, and speak um, about the discipline into um, that space? Um, I'm not sure if I've got a an answer um, for that question, um, except that. Um, certainly in Māori studies, we do a lot of promotion of the discipline and um, the disciplines that sort of become widely um, seen as necessary for advancing the university's strategic goals of incorporating Mātauranga Māori across different um, areas of the university. Um, so I, th I think it's, it's just about, for me, taking the different opportunities that arise but weighing each one up on its merits um, and, and, yeah, really thinking strategically, as people have said before, thinking about potential pathways of, you know, a choice to, to um, do this, for instance, serve on this committee or, uh, or write this opinion piece um, and just sort of thinking about how each piece then potentially connects to the other. And so the people who are best at this are the ones who've been in the institutions for a while and can see how these things have played out in the past. And our institutions are, are changing um, rapidly, but, um, but that institutional knowledge uh, is, is, has been certainly pretty valuable in my experience, having people I can say, well, you know, is this the right thing for me to do right now? Am I sticking my neck out too far? Or, or should I say no to this? Um, I'm not sure that really answers question but that's um that's my my flavor for now as an outsider looking at Susie and Michelle's contribution to me it seems very focused on science outreach and I often wonder 
um, whether this is coming at a cost of their actual research careers. Um, but maybe the science communication is actually where they want to put their emphasis. I personally wouldn't wouldn't really want to go down that area because I'm not interested and I'm much more interested in nutrition and in, folk, in advancing our science knowledge and, and the population's understanding of healthy nutrition. And I would rather use the, the opportunities in the public media, one, to advance that message and two, to you know, advance the connections and networks that I have in the scientific community to continue to be able to do better research. Um, um, and so some of that, time that you're investing as an early career researcher writing non-journal articles you know while it can be it can get in the way I guess of writing the journal articles that are the things that are going to get you promotion and get your PBRF score up high it is worth engaging in those activities as well because they lead to new connections and contributions to the research environment um, but yeah that science promotion I I struggle to see how that is necessary, that how that can contribute in the same way to your career advancement. Um, I'm a little, a little uncomfortable answering, answering this question because I'm good friends with both Susie and, and Michelle. So I, I kind of, you know, I see a lot of the pressure um, that they're under and, and, and don't, don't really, you know, that's up to them to share, I think. But, um, but so let me be a little bit more abstract. <laughs> um, but I, I, I think it's possible, and I think they've both demonstrated that you, via promotion, you can build yourself a platform. Like I mean, to some extent, that's what we, you know, when you when you're getting into this, you are building yourself a constituency. You know, when you when you put that blog post up and it, and you tweet it and it gets noticed by a journalist, that journalist is more likely to come back to you. Like, in those, in those circumstances and so there's this you know there's this thing that goes on where you do build yourself a, a platform you build up contacts in the media that, that will come to you and and so they've both both Susie and Michelle have done it extremely successfully and have very I would say very large platforms and um, uh, constituencies now and then you can then then that actually give, does give you opportunities um, now it's hard to do and they've worked incredibly hard at it um, but you can then use that, that platform to, to develop research opportunities. I know um, both of them have have had research opportunities come out of that come out of that platform, and both of them, it, uh, uh, you know, do a mix. I mean, we we probably see a lot more of the promotion side of things, but they're both doing aspects of scholarship and in, in their work that perhaps is less prominent. Um, so I can certainly. Um, and, and that is probably more effective in some ways because of that platform they've built. I think one, one thing that they do as well is they act as, um, with these big platforms, they kind of act as hubs, right? So, so um, they'll, they'll be, a journalist will come to them and they'll send the journalist off to someone else, right? So they, they, they can be the first port of call. Um, and they, you know, so we're, we're, so they're benefiting more than just themselves in their own agenda. Um, I think that's quite important once you, once you do that, if only to keep your colleagues from, um, <laughs> from lynching you, really. I mean, um, uh, that, that actually sharing some of that, the benefits of that, of the platform, particularly, you know, if you're in a department and you're, you're doing that, you know, you've become hyper visible like that, then, then you probably are putting other strains within within your department, you're probably doing less teaching and contributing to less service. So, you know, so bringing some of those benefits back to your colleagues, I think is quite important. Mm -hmm. well, Can I ask, oh, I was just gonna ask Sean, um, how, how did they create such a big platform? Are you able to shed any insight? Uh, <laughs> at an early stage of their careers. Yeah, um, both worked insanely hard at it. <laughs> um, really, 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 really hard work. Um, uh, so that's you know uh, that a lot of academics do, and they've they you know, of course, but they've chosen to to put work into that. I mean, um, they're both quite different people, extremely different personalities, um, and uh, and it has a different personal effect. 
um, on them, but, but both are working really, really hard at it. So it's not, it's not you know, and, and I think both have had a strategy as well. They've both thought about, you know, I can do this and then I can do that and this can get me somewhere. So, um, so yeah, I think, I think but, it, but again, it's, it's, I come, go back to that Paul Callahan example. He looked like he was a natural, but, but he was also working very hard at it. Oh. Tom, did you have anything to add to um, Only to Bill's question seemed to me about the relationship between promoting one's discipline or promoting the you know, science in general and your own personal scholarship. Um, and it would seem that the disciplines are promoted through forms of personal scholarship, that whether we like it or not, we've become ambassadors for our disciplines when we're out there speaking about some sort of topical interest that we might be a part of, um, which works well for a lot of disciplines. For geography, where Bill and myself are based, it doesn't work well at all, I find, because you c to call yourself a geographer is to be totally irrelevant to people's understanding. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, as, as an example, a colleague of mine was on the Sunday program recently. The journalist, he, he was a big part of the program, the journalist asked, so what shall we call you? And he said, well, I'm a lecturer in human geography. And they said, yeah, that's not going to work. <laughs> they said, can we call you a sociologist? And he's like, oh, I don't think the sociologists are going to like that. Uh, so even when you try to promote your discipline in a de facto way through your presence as a public scholar, it can be very difficult. Um, so yeah, sometimes the connection between public scholarship and disciplinary promotion are not as um, synergistic as one. <laughs> we need a new name. Yeah, that's quite I, was, I was going to say Corbin was accused of being a jog look, looking like a geography teacher. I was just thinking about that when they're talking about the British political <laughs> situation. <laughs> Mm. Uh, yeah, I was at a school recently and they said, one of the teachers of physics teacher said, ah, oh, geography, that's just colouring in, isn't it? So, oh, yeah. um, anyway. <laughs> Can I just apologise on behalf of all physicists? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so just in the final um, minutes we've got left, I just wanted um, each of our panellists just to say very briefly, in a minute or less, what the one piece of advice for emerging public scholars would be? So maybe if we throw it back to Lisa to start with, and we'll look back down to finish with Ocean. Um, be brave. <laughs> awesome. Yeah. yeah. Cool. Yeah. That's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> got nothing. I think I just have to quickly add to that. I, um, Lisa mentioned um, a famous tweet earlier on, and maybe not even uh, yeah. what it was, but I think Lisa really is an ambassador for bravery in this space. So, um, yeah, yeah. That's a great piece of advice. Yes, I, I made it was before I really realised I had a public. Well, I didn't really have a public put image, really, or or whatever you call it, at this point, and I. There were people being dicks in our field, and I called them out on Twitter, called Jordan Williams a twat, and it just <laughs> blew up. <laughs> um, I, the VC got a letter from him claiming I defamed him, and <laughs> Whale Oil went through my Twitter history and found anything that looked defamatory, uh, you know, inappropriate, took it out of context, and I was the evil person. But as a result of that, the public health community came in behind me and went to town against Cameron Slater, Jordan Williams, and Carrot Graham, and they were hounded off Twitter for a while, and I got, like, 500 followers through that <laughs> and gained a bit of a reputation. And it was quite upsetting at the time because I actually got an official letter of warning of dismissal from the university as a result of all this. But, you know, in the end, I've just had to let it go and, you know, see the advantages that it's brought me. And it's really just taught me, one, to be a little bit more careful <laughs> about what you say on Twitter, but two, you know, not to let it bring you down and just to see it as a badge of honour if you get whaled oiled. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> it's really interesting that we haven't had time to discuss and maybe it's a whole other webinar is how you navigate this stuff and um, how institutions do or don't back you and different kinds of institutions but I think that's a discussion for another day but yeah. it's so interesting and important I think but yeah. Yeah. Um, Tom do you want to go next? 
Um, I think participating in forms of public scholarship requires a different approach to um, the process of constructing your intervention. So in a, when you're writing a journal article, for example, at least in the social sciences, I think the, the writing process is, itself is how you figure out what it is you want to say so that you don't necessarily know at the start, but as you write it, the writing is thinking. Where forms of public scholarship, you're not afforded that luxury. You really need to figure out what you want to say before you do the thing that you do. So if it's obviously being on television would be a perfect example, you're needing to know what it is your points are, as Lisa pointed out at the start, but also if you're writing an opinion article, an effective opinion article, you really need to know what it is you want to say before you write it. So I think trying to figure out, figure out that message um, at the beginning is an important shift in the mindset of how you approach that process compared to standard forms of scholarly production. Yeah, I think that's so perceptive. <laughs> so true. Yeah, Sean. Oh, look, I, yeah, so very practical advice. I've already said this, but the, the Science Media Centre um, media savvy workshops. Um, and, uh, you know, it's not just hard scientists. It's open to, um, to social scientists and, and people from uh, the humanities as well. Um, so, so definitely that can give you the practical tools and, and just give you an understanding of how the media works and de demystify it because it's actually surprisingly not that complicated, um, but, but it's sometimes but a little bit counterintuitive. Um, so, so just taking you through that and understanding what happens, I think, is is a, is, a, um, is really awesome. Um, mine um, is just um, take your opportunities and pick your battles, and um, let your gut help you make the decision. Um, that's certainly been helpful for me in the past. Is how do you know what's an opportunity and what's a battle, which to take and which to pick? Uh, well, for me, um, I guess my gut feeling about things has been quite actually sound a lot of the time. So, you know, something that feels exciting as an opportunity. Um, I've never regretted taking any of those. Um, but something that sort of puts a bit of a knot in my tummy, um, I've also never regretted um, not picking those battles. So... Um, yeah, take opportunities, but pick your battles. Um, so we're out of time. We have used the full hour and a half. Um, so I would like to thank uh, each of us for the panelists very much. I think this has just been such a rich uh, discussion that I have deeply appreciated. And um, for me, as I grapple with all of these things, I think I can have come out of this with um, some clarity around some things and further questions about others. So. Um, yeah, thank you very much to all four of you and to everyone that's come along um, and hopefully you can make it along to the next um, ESOC site, Early Career, Postgraduate Research Network webinar. <laughs> 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 combination of those words. So, <laughs> thank you.